Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Emily Lamiska, and I am Director of Communications for the U.S. Pain Foundation. Today we're going to be talking about an issue that is very sensitive, but also very important to the pain community, and that is suicide. Um, we're very honored to have a panel of three experts in mental health and pain who I'll introduce in a moment. You can see them here. Um, they will be discussing risk factors, coping techniques, resources for help, and what we can do to fix this problem overall. Um, the format of today's webinar will be as follow follows. Well, first, we'll have the panel discussion, which will last about 30 to 45 minutes. Then we'll answer questions from the audience. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can for about five to 10 minutes. Um, once the panel discussion comes to an end, we'll have a few updates from department staff, which you're welcome to stick around for. Um, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. So for one, there are three handouts that you can download at any time during the webinar. To access those, click on the section labeled handouts um, in the control panel on the right of your screen. Um, again, when the panel discussion ends, we'll have time for some questions from the audience to ask those questions. Um, there's a little section labeled questions, and just type in your questions there. I'll be looking through those and then um, referring them to the panel. Also, if you need to sign off before the end, that's totally fine. Um, I understand people have time constraints. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available in our next newsletter. So you can always watch it there. Um, lastly, we have a feedback survey at the end. It will launch when the webinar closes. Um, and it's, I think it's maybe three or four questions, so it's very easy. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, so I'm going to start with Dr. Rosenbaum. Dr. Rosenbaum, can you wave hi just so people know <laughs> who you are? Great. Um, so Dr. Rosenbaum is a clinical neuropsychologist, psychotherapist, a Zen practice leader, and a senior teacher of, let's see if I pronounce this correctly, Diane Chi Kong. How'd I do? Okay. Um, he brings a lifetime of practice to the moment-by-moment -moment harmonization of body, mind, and spirit. Dr. Rosenbaum has been a Fulbright professor at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neuroscience in India, chief psychologist at Kaiser Permanente, and director of a California Institute of Integral Studies psychology training program. His most recent books are Walking the Way, 81 Zen Encounters with the Tao Te Ching, hopefully I got that right, and What's Wrong with Mindfulness and What Isn't. He currently resides in the San Francisco area. Next up, we have Dr. Lev. Dr. Lev, could you wave for us? That's mm -hmm. Dr. Lev. Uh, so after receiving his PhD in 1994 from the Wright Institute Graduate School of Clinical Psychology, Dr. Lev ran a private practice and worked as a part-time instructor in graduate clinical education and as director of the Family Counseling Center at Height Ashbury Psychological Services. He began his work as a behavioral medicine health psychologist in 1995 at Children's Hospital Oakland. Eventually, he took a position at Pain and Rehabilitative Consultants Medical Group in 2000 and transferred to Kaiser Permanente Medical Center in 2002, where he worked closely with other providers in two different interdisciplinary pain programs, Oakland and Vallejo. In 2014, he relocated to Hawaii, where he presently runs the Comfort Clinic, which is geared specially towards people with pain, and he is chief psychologist for a chronic pain program at, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing these, but... Um, I'm A-O-H-A. Okay, that's, that's the name of the city, and Honolulu. He's also an adjunct faculty member at Argosa University. In addition, he is author of You Are Bigger Than the Pain, a self-help book for people with pain. And lastly, we have Gwen Herman. Gwen, could you wave, although yeah, <laughs> I'm sure people know by now. Um, so we are very honored that Gwen is one of our own staff members at U.S. Pain. Um, Gwen is a social worker by training, and she has lived with chronic pain for 23 years due to a motor vehicle accident. Um, frustrated by the lack of resources for people with pain, in 1999, she founded Pain Connection, a national network of chronic pain support groups, support group leader trainings, and more. In 2016, Pain Connection joined forces with the U.S. Pain Foundation as has continued to expand its offering. In 2009, um, Gwen co-authored the book, Making the Invisible Visible, a chronic pain manual for healthcare providers. And in 2018, so very recently, she was appointed to the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee, uh, the highest ranking pain policy oversight committee in the country. So um, I just wanted to, I know that kind of took a few minutes, but I think it's important to kind of know um, the backgrounds that these individuals have um, and why they're such a good fit for today's talk. Um, I just want to express to all three of you, thank you so much for being here with us and, and taking the time 
um, it's really appreciated. So I'd like to um, start just by going over the study that prompted us to cover this topic today. Um, so this study was published in September in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and it found that more than 10% of suicide cases in the United States involve chronic pain. Um, and for those of us who have chronic pain, you know, we have long known that pain can cause depression, anxiety, um, and suicidal thoughts on top of physical suffering. But this was, I think, one of the first times that it was really studied on such a large scale and sort of brought to the attention of the broader public. Um, and it's, you know, hopefully open up a conversation and some more emphasis on this issue and, and what we can do to address it. So, um, with that said, I'm just going to kind of jump into our panel questions and get some dialogue going. So, I wanted to start by asking you guys um, whether you were, you know, surprised by this finding that 10% of cases of suicide involve chronic pain, whether you think that estimate is accurate, whether it's higher or lower. Um, and Dr. Rosenbaum, maybe we'll start with you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised by the finding. Um, uh, some of the results of the research indicates that this has been rising uh, from about 7 or 8% to about 10% over the past few years. But Roughly one in five or one in four chronic pain <laughs> patients has suicidal ideation. Um, anyone who works with pain knows, anyone who's had pain, and I think all of the pa panelists and probably most of the people listening have an experience of pain, know that there are times where you just go, it just ain't worth it. <laughs> you know, do anything, you know, just get me out of here. Um, uh, people with chronic pain are five times more likely to express a desire to die compared to patients with acute pain. Um, death by suicide is about uh, double that uh, in the compared to the the general population. Uh, chronic pain patients much more likely. So it's not surprising to find that there's a high percentage of folks who uh, of the folks who commit suicide have chronic pain. Um, maybe I should pause there. Uh, in terms of the accuracy, it's it's, it's very difficult uh, to know if, how accurate this is. There's probably a lot of suicides which are not accounted for, whether they be automobile accidents or. Uh, how many of the overdoses are intentional versus unintentional, hard to know. But we're probably in the, the rough ballpark of, of where things are. Right. Okay. Um, Dr. Lev, what was your reaction to the study when you first heard about it? Oh, just like Dr. Rosenbaum, I'm not surprised, sadly, especially since um, the, uh, the advent of the opiate crisis. And the effect on uh, essentially what I've seen in my patients, the reduction of providing necessary medications for those who use them responsibly, uh, some of them are feeling very, very desperate. Uh, and I'm not surprised, although this study may have predated um, what is I'm seeing is a withholding of uh, at least a modicum of medications uh, that people are feeling desperate. And, but even before then, uh, as Dr. Rosenbaum said, you know, this is killing me. You know, I might as well kill myself. Sometimes people will go to that place. And it makes sense, All right. sadly. And Gwen, I know you've encountered this in your work with support groups. Um, what did you think when you heard this, these results? I thought it was low. <laughs> I was surprised okay. by it. Um, and I was just happy. Um, committee, the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee, and Dr. Helmick was talking about the study, and only 18 states were included in this survey, and the survey was the National Violin Death Reporting System, and people that were interviewed were 10 years old that had chronic pain and older, and um, also that the, they received the data from death certificates, coroner, you know, medical examiner reports, law enforcement reports, toxicology reports. So, you 
you know, it, those statistics, you're really not sure about it, but I would think there was more people that have died because of chronic yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's such a hard number to um, get a full grasp on in our, you know, our recording for suicides. Yeah. Um, our system is not great and not very precise. Um, it, was one of the, it was one of the things. Um, he did say that the majority were older white males. 50% died from firearms yes. and only 16% from opioids. Yes. So there may be some confusion mm -hmm. on what laws need to be enforced. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Interesting. Okay. Uh, yes, um, that kind maybe. Of Maybe this would be a, a good point uh, to follow up on what Gwen has said. Uh, within the study, uh, they looked at um, the opioid overdoses and uh, they found, al although opioid prescribing has increased markedly, the percentage of people with chronic pain who died by overdose did not increase over this time period. Mm -hmm. So even though more folks are taking opioids and they're, they're floating around, um, firearms remains uh, by far the most dangerous uh, yeah. means yeah. for suicide. And, and, you know, the panic over opioids is, is sometimes, uh, I think, uh, misplaced. There are issues uh, with opioids. But what this says to us is, it says to me is, there are a lot of people with pain. There are a lot of people who feel miserable enough to kill themselves. This is on, both of those are on the rise. And this is something we need to take very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, that sort of ties into one of my next questions, which was, um, you know, what do you guys, what kind of a role do you think the opioid crisis has played um, in affecting suicide rates in people with pain? And obviously it's a very um, difficult topic and there's, you know, we have to kind of weigh the needs of people with substance use disorders mm -hmm. and those with pain. Um, but like Dr. Lev said, you know, we're seeing a, you know, US pain gets a lot of emails from patients who are, you know, feeling like no one wants to help them and um, mm -hmm. You know, they're being turned down by doctors, and that sort of exacerbates that feeling of helplessness. Um, yeah. So, you know, what do you what do you guys think about like how that sort of played a role? Um, and you know, at the same token, opioids can be used to overdose. Um, so it's really a sort of a double edged sword. Um, so, so maybe um, Gwen, like, what do you think? How do you think that's played a role? Um, what What should we be doing? In regards to that, I know that's a huge question. That <laughs> could probably be its own panel. Um, sort of, what have you seen in your in your experiences with patients and in the support groups with people um, struggling with that specifically? Yeah, I mean desperation of people who have either been on opioids for years on the same dosage to the same doctor and have never lost a prescription, um, the urine test have all come out okay, and all of a sudden either they're fired by their doctor, or they're transferred to somebody else, or all of a sudden they're drastically cut down, and there's just no other alternative to them. Um, so they're desperate and really vulnerable. Um, you know, the doctor was the person they were supposed to trust and to help them through it, and they feel completely lost and all alone and they don't, they just don't know where to go. So a lot of desperation and not seeing the end in sight. I mean, like I think you said in the beginning that uh, for people with chronic pain, you know, me including in those first four years, especially, I thought of killing myself every single day. But it wasn't that I wanted to kill myself, I just wanted to pain to end. So I was not treated, for, you know, I was undertreated and I wasn't getting the proper diagnosis. So it was just not knowing and not knowing and having that pain is, is panic. You know, people just panic. So um, this really affected, you know, the chronicling community. Dr. Rosenbaum, do you want to jump in there? Well, I, I want to say something which might be a little controversial. 
Um, I don't think we have an opioid crisis in this country. I think we have a chronic pain crisis. More and more people are in pain. Um, the stresses that people are under are severe. Yes, there have been problems with uh, uh, opioid overprescription, no question about that. But in terms of risks for uh, abuse in opioids, the best research I've found on this has been a Cochrane database research study where they looked at uh, 2,600 people uh, who were on uh, maintenance opioids. These were people who had been, uh, nothing else had worked. They were stable on them. They were prescribed appropriately. Of the 2,600 people, the number of folks who developed addiction and abuse problems, out of 2,600, seven, seven over the course of a year. Um, I think most of us who work with chronic pain and are familiar with it is when they're used appropriately, there's a role for opioids. A lot of people don't get benefit from it. A lot of people can't tolerate the side effects. Um, you shouldn't start with opioids and just throw them at people. But the opioid crisis is, is a mask for the tremendous pain people are in. Uh, people are being forced to work harder for less money. Uh, the stresses are tremendous. The support groups are not as available. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, it, it's not, <laughs> I'll just reinforce what Gwen said. It's a pain problem um, and the, the and a misery problem, not an opiate mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, if I can say, I mean, uh, totally agree. Uh, and actually, it's funny because probably my colleagues are also agreeing that doing skills, which maybe we'll talk about later, the very things that a person in pain can do to actually change their body to feel better is something we all advocate but i also I, we advocate uh, what i call it is skills and pills approach you have a balance you have a balance of uh a modicum of of pain medications that can be useful to help the person use the skills and move their their life forward and what really annoys me is uh, the stereotype of of uh, people in pain as uh, drug addicts essentially and as, as uh, Dr. Rosenbaum just quoted, and there were other studies before that essentially show very minimal amount, uh, uh, small percentages of people in chronic pain become addicted, okay? They are using it, and basically it's called pseudo addiction. If, if they look like they're addicted, meaning they're more focused on, I need more meds because the pain, it's not helping, uh, it's a pseudo addiction. They look like addicts, but their purpose is to lower the pain, not to get high or escape from their emotional problems. And um, it's pretty clear that when you can give them other support, whether psychological, physical therapy, or other kinds of support uh, uh, or skills, they uh, will ask for less medication because they will start to get what they're really looking for, which is to get more comfortable. And so this is the difficulty I'm seeing. It really annoys me when, when we're, pain patients are stereotyped in this way. Right. Yeah, a lot of people seem to be getting sort of lost in the, the struggle here. Um, people who just want pain relief. Um, and I, you know, it's hard to think of a, you know, whatever your, your views are on how we should prescribe opioids and when they should be used. You know, what's really unacceptable to me is just, when a doctor drops a patient um, and says that there's nothing they can do. And, you know, I, I can't imagine, and I, you know, I've, I've had some experience with that myself as a patient, um, but no matter what doctors, you know, how they want to approach pain, fine, like everyone has different views, but it's just the idea that, that doctors are dropping people. Um, I can't imagine that that does not significantly contribute to um, yeah. suicide cases. Um, um, let me just say one word on that before we, uh, I, while I completely agree it's, it's terrible for a doctor to drop someone, it's, it's just unethical, um, before we start blame the doctors, a lot of them are unhappy uh, about this. <laughs> I see your cat, that's a, I know, a good sorry about him. management <laughs> tool, it's a good animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
I've heard many doctors say they are frustrated by the kinds of administrative oversights and legislative so-called oversights which restrict what they can do, uh, which you know are looking over their shoulders, which just make it very harder and harder to treat chronic pain patients uh, as mm-hmm. in a reasonable way. So, you know, they're responding to these other pressures as well, which doesn't excuse the dropping patients, but it's a, and the DEA, it's a systemic problem. And the DEA oversight sometimes is a, a bit overly restrictive, let's say. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yes, I mean, some, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, doctors sort of feel like their hands are being forced in some instances. They, you know, they yeah. feel like they, they don't have a choice and they're afraid of getting into trouble. Um, That's right. So I wanted to ask, kind of move along from that. So, so that can be one risk factor. You know, it's obviously not having adequate pain management. Um, what do you guys see as other risk factors for patients, um, both from a like a personal perspective, what people should be mindful of for themselves? Like, am I more at risk of this? And and you know, also what clinicians should they be looking out for? Um, Dr. Lev, do you want to start on that? Um, actually, Chris, I'd love to hear from Gwen. Okay. <laughs> sure, yeah. She's, fine. She's, she's in it in a different way. I'm happy to talk about it, but I first want right. to hear from Gwen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, the, I mean, the main thing is that usually cr- depression goes hand in hand with chronic pain. I mean, if you didn't have depression beforehand, you're probably going to develop it, you know, to some extent. You know, some people do say they have no depression at all, but I see there's a small minority of people that I've met through, through you know, working in the field for so long. But, um, you know, the depression is due to all the losses, you know, in a person's life, the whole grieving process. Um, and also physically, what's going on in their nervous system. So the pain is creating havoc in their system, so their emotions are all haywire. So depression is a, a major issue for people in chronic pain. So take away treatment options and lack of support, um, then depression gets higher and then you get into this dark, you know, this dark circle and it's just overwhelming and uh, it's very hard for people to get out of that. So the main thing is for any significant other family, friends, as soon as you see somebody in that position, it's really important that you gently tell them about it, you know, there's different types of community services, and I know we'll go into that a little bit later. It's mainly, you know, looking for depression, um, looking at sleep patterns. I mean, most people with chronic pain are not sleeping anyway. So, and then the depression being higher, that's, you know, the sleep is going to be affected that, you know, they're not getting REM, they're not going through the sleep cycle. So it's really, you know, hurting their hormones and everything. So sleep, um, being isolated, chronic pain makes you isolated, then the depression makes you even more isolated, not getting out, talking to each other. And some people don't have supportive families. You know, some people are told to get over it or, you know, just, you know, try this new therapy or if you just say three things that you're grateful for, then right. you're going to <laughs> or, or, or exercise. And we always laugh about that in our support group about exercise because most of our exercise is, is maybe getting out of bed and maybe taking a shower. And if you've done that, you're finished for the day. But, um, you know, if you have no support network around you, it's so important to let somebody yeah. you know help you. And and get to all of those things <laughs> also lead to something um, that... Well, one way to get really depressed, especially when you, you first have the pain problem and you, you can't work, is you lose your life schedule. And so, the, you know, you want to get depressed, just don't go to work for a week and don't have fun. So what I recommend is people have fun because another issue is people aren't having enough enjoyment in life. Uh, of course, you know, isolated, they don't have the social enjoyment, but they don't have just regular enjoyment. Uh, even one fellow I work with who, who liked to sit in his backyard and just look at his garden. Well, he didn't do it for years until I suggested why don't you get back to it. So not even having things like that that interfere, increase depression and anxiety, which is another one, one of those psychological problems that, that comes up, 
because again, and we'll probably get into this, is, you know, how pain works is all of these things increase, like uh, Dr. Rosenbaum said, misery. And when your misery goes up, then uh, the nervous system becomes more hypersensitive to pain. It's just, it's, it's a vicious circle. Uh, so these things can drive someone to want to end their life if they don't know that there are, are great options in addition to medication. Yes. So I, I agree completely with uh, what both Gwen and uh, Daniel have said. I, I'd like to emphasize the sleep issues a bit because, uh, boy, that makes everything worse physiologically, psychologically. And it's a problem with chronic pain. The, the worse you sleep, the worse the pain. The more depressed you get, the worse the pain. Um, it can really, and sleep issues are undertreated. Uh, a lot of people just don't have the basic information about how to deal with sleep problems. Um, the, the sense of, I, I think we should mention uh, in terms of risk factors, Ready access to means of, of killing yourself is, is always a big risk factor. And uh, the, the two things which come to mind are, um, if there are guns in the house, put a combination lock on them at least, or get them out of the house. Um, if you are uh, suicidal or, or depressed, um, and you have lots of uh, analgesia, and alcohol at home, you, you want to uh, minimize that um, so that uh, it's harder to overdose because a lot of suicides are done either impulsively or you're groggy and you're not thinking straight. Um, so taking care of that. Um, in terms of the depression, um, you know, chronic pain changes your sense of who you are. It, it's it's um, that sense of helplessness, that sense of identity. I'm reluctant to say that chronic pain patients get depressed um, because uh, Gregory Bateson used to say that there's no such thing as depression. Depression is uh, a word we put to, to summarize a, a of a variety of other things. I don't know how to treat depression. I know how to treat sadness. I know how to treat uh, sleep problems. I know how to treat lack of doing anything. I, I know how to treat um, uh, lack of support. So it, once you take the global sense of I'm depressed into, well, what does that mean specifically in terms of how to deal with the pain, how to deal with your employer, how to deal with a disability system, which is you know running you through the mail and giving you tons of paperwork that you have to fill out. Um, right. All those specific things are manageable. It's when they all just get glommed together that the risk for suicide and helplessness and feeling overwhelmed goes up. Yeah, that's that's in, that's intrinsic to also the problem of a person in pain which is their label, like the label of depression. They're like, you're a pain patient. And so suddenly a whole set of things come in, oh, well, that's who you are. And I mean, uh, you're bigger than that. There's much more to a person than uh, a condition. And to break it down, as Bob was saying, into the component actual problem, I can't sleep, I feel sad, it's much more manageable than depression or the chronic, you know, fibromyalgia. Oh my God! And you're much, there's just much, much more to a person than that, and it changes how you are treated. Yeah. Oh, one more risk factor. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to go back to that because um, yeah, Brian, what do you I understand what everybody I understand what you're both are saying, but in the in the midst of a um, feeling that everything is gone, that you have nothing, all you feel is that depression and that devastation. So, you know, in that moment when somebody's going to kill themselves, you know, that's where they are in that dark place. So, um, so maybe, you know, you're talking in general about, you know, how do they um, try to look at their life in a different manner that would be different. But, so I just wanted to make that clear. All right. 
just a matter of you know sort of what we're calling it, but I think we're talking about the same yeah, type of feeling, yeah. basically. Um, Dr. Rosenbaum, you wanted to mention another risk factor? Yeah, so um, it, there's some research which indicates the worse the pain, the more likely, uh, the, the greater the risk is for suicide. Um, <clears throat> but uh, when, the gener when your pain-specific risk factors overlap with general risk factors for suicide, so for example, we know that uh, if you have had a family member who committed suicide, you're at much greater risk for suicide. So um, if, if, that's, if you're a pain patient and you've had this in your background, you have to be a little careful uh, in terms of your self-monitoring and, and talking to folks around you. If you're a provider, this is the sort of thing you want to ask about. Has there been anyone in your family who, who suicided? And the life events, if you've just lost your job because your employer has let you go saying, sorry, you know, you're just not doing things, that kind of life event is a risk factor. Um, so it's not just the internal stuff that's happening to a person, it's the other things around them which are affecting them as well and can uh, affect the risks. Okay. So then the, the big question is, you know, what do we do to mitigate those risk factors? Um, so first, I'd like to kind of have you guys speak from the patient's perspective and what they can do to help themselves. And then we'll kind of go over to what clinicians can do and maybe what family members can do. Um, so Glenn, I'll have you start with, you know, what, what do you think, what can patients do to try to address these risk factors in themselves? Yeah, it's uh, it's <coughs> really, it's very hard, especially, it depends where the person is in the process of having chronic pain, you know, is it at the very beginning stages, is the middle, or is it, you know, going forward, it depends, you know, where they're at, um, because, you know, there are some, some people at the beginning stages who are still in denial. They just can't believe that they still have this chronic pain in their life. It's, it's not going to get better. So it's, um, you have to approach them in a different way than you would approach to somebody who's had it for 20 years and has already realized that they've taken steps to try to, you know, um, get a better quality of life because they've dealt with you know, the denial and are more into um, acceptance that their body has changed. So it's really uh, listening to them, understanding where they're at, um, giving them support, giving them resources. Uh, a lot of times I think I, like I try to be the eyes for them because right now they're in a dark hole and they can't see. So it's like I'm going to help them see past it and guide them, you know, past that. So that um, these are the steps they need to take, you know, to you know get a hold of themselves, to get you know, treatment, to get support, you know, connect them to other um, different providers that you know can help. Them. Uh, so, so that would be a main thing. Uh, the next thing is also that you know we're not we're not raised to deal with the pain at all. You know, Western society, we just don't know about pain. We're just told to ignore it. Um, there's a lot of stigma on having chronic pain. Um, so not only is it in the general public, but we have it ourselves, you know, pain patients ourselves. So every time, even on the phone calls, you know, people from across the country, we still feel that maybe we're guilty of something or that we cause the pain or we deserve the pain or, um, you know, people don't believe us or why aren't I getting better? There's all these, these stigmas also about, you know, what are you supposed to look like? If you look okay and you go shopping and somebody says, oh, you look good today, and oh, you don't have any pain. So we're dealing with all that stigma ourselves that we have about what pain is. So we have to educate ourselves as well as, you know, the community about, you know, you know we are normal people with chronic pain. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. this is the way, you know, yes. we do it trying to normalize their condition and um, not talking down to people. So what I was talking about when I was talking about the gratitude, like three things of gratitude, you know, somebody who's in the beginning stages is not, is not there. You know, their pain has to be 
water under control. So until it's under control, you, you know, it's hard to go in with those types of approaches unless somebody had that orientation, you know, before their pain started. So I'll let everybody else, you know, have a chance. But, but, yeah. but that's why really one of the first things, you know, is to break that isolation. Um, many things you were saying is along those lines to find somebody who is a caring, loving person uh who you can just talk to because you, you get out of yourself you're just by yourself you're just going to have all of those super suicidal painful depressing thoughts driving you nuts but it helps to talk with someone who is loving and supportive and in addition to find professional uh a counselor a therapist who understands uh let's say you know pain psychologists but there are other people who understand what you're going through and can not only be supportive I can help you with some skills you can use to start to get more comfortable uh, in addition to having the support and break in the isolation. Um, certainly, again, agreeing uh, with both of them. And I want to emphasize the issue of stigma, um, not only for chronic pain, but for being depressed and the mm -hmm. stigma around feeling suicidal. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anyone who exists who has not had a suicidal thought but people have this deep shame and they keep it secret and the secret is is your enemy and to be upfront about it you know well this is one of those days boy where you know if you <laughs> um and you know i've had periods where i've had depression and chronic pain and and whatnot and sometimes um if I'm going with my partner or, or a family member and they say, oh, you want to drive? I'll go, you know, today's not the best day for me to be the driver. Because um, it only takes a moment of, uh, of fogging out or going, well, you know, maybe I'll just go that little bit faster around this curve. And there you are. So to, to self-monitor and, and realize it's, natural to sometimes feel suicidal mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily a big deal <laughs> it's, it's, it's like oh my god i'm suicidal so <laughs> uh, uh but are you uh and actually it's sometimes useful to just look the suicidality in the face and go yeah it'd be nice to, to not have to live with all this do I really want to die? Let's just think about this for a moment. Do I really want to die? Yeah. Who um, would I miss? That's right. <laughs> no. Um, and and to to look confront it actively. Right. Yeah, I think it's important for people to kind of remember that with pain, especially severe pain, you know, if you're not having the feelings of depression and anxiety and possibly suicide like there might actually be something wrong with you like it's it is so normal and understandable mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of you know addressing the pain itself and then addressing mm -hmm. you know the things that it causes and the, the emotional impact that it has and the impact that it has on your life um, Gwen did you yeah. want to say something there yeah, just, yeah. I just I wanted to share something about that because there was at a point where I um, was transferred. I was at a leading hospital, and I was being diagnosed whether or not I would be a good candidate for a methadone or not. And um, I was interviewed by an intern who um was asking me all these questions i traveled for an hour to the appointment I, my pain level was very high i was um had no my frustration level was very high um i just wanted to see the doctor i just wanted to hear results i couldn't deal with anybody else and then the doctor came in and i forgot what he said and i started crying and i just broke down crying and um all of a sudden he's shaking his head he's going like this and he goes God, I think you need to be inpatient. And at that moment, there's no way in the world I would have told him that I had suicidal thoughts about it because here, just because I was showing my emotion of, God, you know, this is just too much for me, that I, I of course I wouldn't say anything deeper than that. So it, I, I closed up completely, completely yeah. closed up. 
And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to share that because when you were talking, yeah. Emily, it just like this thing just came to my head and I wanted to share that. It's too much for the doctor, not for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I still get questions when I'm teaching uh, professionals of, so how do you tell whether the pain is real or if it's emotional? <laughs> it's just, uh, <laughs> yeah. they're always both there. <laughs> you know, how do you really? get that across? Um, yeah. Because they always need a blood test or something physical to show what is a neurological process that you can't easily see. Well, yeah. and, and emotions are a neurological process. Hello? Right. Hello? Yeah. Involved with your nerves. Right, right. Right. They're both both very real. Um, yeah, so I think, so for Pisha, so I, Gwen, I like that you said before about, you know, step one is really trying to get the pain under control to some degree because it is really hard to um, deal with the emotional issues if you can't even, you know, get out of bed or, or whatever else. Um, so it sounds like, you know, that's sort of like a good first step. And then I'm, what I'm hearing from you all is sort of, um, you know, seek out some, like once you have your pain under a little bit more control, then you need to start thinking about the emotional side of things. Um, I like you know, they do it at the same time. You really okay. need the support. That will help your body too, along with the medical treatment. Well, and this is a tricky question, but um, sometimes you can't get the pain under control. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've certainly seen patients, uh, I've experienced it myself short term, but there are even certain conditions which long term, uh, you know, thalamic pain, stuff like that very very difficult and i've had patients uh, say to me you know if if we've tried everything i i want to talk about i'm 28 years old to spend the next 40 years of my life in terrible pain um i want to think about the possibility of suicide and will you help me and um i think we need to just be very compassionate and listen uh, very carefully and non-judgmentally to people who when they're faced with uncontrollable agony on an unrelenting basis to go well you know let's let's just think about it um, and and acknowledge how hard this is and what the options are um, and you know, everyone's going to have their own ethical guidelines on this mm -hmm. but personally i feel it's not completely it's not necessarily inappropriate for someone faced with a lifetime of untreatable pain to consider um uh, that it it might be better to to not go on um i i respect people who entertain that as one option um, although I prefer it if we can find, you know, treatments and we can help them. But sometimes that's not possible. And then we need to be honest. And honesty is, actually, honesty is a good uh, antidote to depression very often. Mm -hmm. So what do you all think that, um, you know, doctors can do differently? And I, I'm speaking, you know, to primary care physician, uh, pain specialist, because I think, so many pain patients don't even, it's so hard to just deal with the ins and outs of daily pain and just getting through the day and trying to work and trying to treat your pain. They just don't have the, the bandwidth to even address the emotional issues, even if that might help the physical pain itself. Um, so how do we get clinicians to prioritize mental health in chronic pain patients? Um, how do we get pain patients to prioritize it? You know, how, how does someone go from being in pain to, you know, connecting, you know, finding a, a therapist like one of you, um, and, and all of you happen to be very, you know, experts in pain, but so many therapists are more generalist. Um, so sorry, that's sort of got into a larger question, but, you know, I guess how, what can we do for clinicians to be the first part of that? Um, to make this give, them the right, 
to give them the right referral source because really when it comes down to it, uh, if the, the client is not responding to just the physician's treatment, okay, or maybe a general uh, therapist, um, a multidisciplinary chronic pain program, and Bob and I were both in the same one, we've seen the changes that happen with people when they come and they see a physician who understands, they see psychologists, physical therapists, and other allied uh, practitioners to basically in a way of rehabilitation help get them back on their feet, show them the multiple options there are to get more comfortable um, in addition to just the medical. Okay, and so uh, we're starting this prop uh, program in, in Kaneohe here in Hawaii, but there are around the world are different places where you refer the person to a program that gives them an interdisciplinary uh, a set of, of providers who work together so that they can find a way to get more comfortable. And if there is no program like that in your area, minimally, a counselor who does know about chronic illness and chronic pain it can be supportive that way. Uh, that would be at least uh, the first salvo. I mean, you certainly, you can get my book, you can get other books uh, uh, that are supported in um, providing other options uh, that you can, if you, you know, use books in that way to be able to uh, increase your comfort level, increase your, your, your social life. But that's what these programs do. They help you with skills like socializing, uh, like meditation, like other things that have been found to help your body feel better and help you get back to, to life. So, Daniel, um, I, I'd like to say I basically agree with you, but um, in many places where I've been teaching, uh, what I hear uh, from the professionals is they don't have resources. There's just oh, yeah, nothing available in their community. Right. And so at the very least, every professional who treats pain should have the U.S. Pain Foundation's uh, referral mm -hmm. uh, information mm -hmm. on the card. They should have Gwen's patient uh, support network referral on a card at a minimum. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are available, you know, through the web. One also has to be careful. I've seen uh, providers who give you know, the latest fad, whether it's mindfulness or three gratitudes right. or whatnot, say, right, right. just do this. And they give the card right, right. Just throw it at them. Right. and it's going to be easy. And so just to have providers say, this is difficult. I acknowledge this is difficult. Let's and I believe you. you. And I believe you. Yeah. Boy, 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 is that important. I believe you. Um, and I'd also like to widen the net and say, um, you know, the medical profession needs to deal with this, but we have to strengthen economic supports. Um, so many pain patients are affected economically. Um, and then you not only have pain, but now you have all the worries about, can you support your family? Is there gonna be a paycheck? And is there gonna be your, your uh, a job? And uh, rather than having legislatures passing laws saying you can only prescribe so many opioids, they, they need to be passing laws which provide funding for uh, programs, uh, for economic security for, for pain patients who are struggling. Uh, it's really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing I wanted to stress was um, on a larger scale too, is that in medical schools, um, students have to be taught about chronic pain, not just the physical aspect, but the psychosocial um, aspect of it also, and the grieving process. And right now, we're, we work with John Hopkins, first year medical students, and we go and we bring um, people who have chronic pain to them, and they tell their stories, and they're able to ask questions. Sure. And to really sensitize the medical students about what it's like to have chronic pain, you know, we're real people. <laughs> and, um, and also for doctors who are already practicing that they have CEMEs, that it's mandated they have CMEs, and that in their offices, that if they can't do counseling with their clients, that they have social workers or counselors there, you know, somebody in the office that can talk with people and, you know, help them 
you know, find these resources. But yeah, there's no reason why a doctor should even say we don't have resources because all they have to do is go on the internet and find U.S. Pain or another organization and refer the person there. So um, it's just taking the time, one more step, you know, to helping somebody. But it is education of medical professionals and, you know, and the general public. Yeah. Yeah. R real fast, uh, American Chronic Pain Association is another uh, a peer led uh, group that's really good, American Chronic Pain Association. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe to, to emphasize the, the word chronic. Um, a lot of medical professionals, uh, so much of the medical system is geared towards acute care. Um, and it's hard to imagine, okay, you're going, you have this every day, not for months, not for three months, not for a year, but every day, year after year. It's just hard, especially for younger uh, providers, to just conceive of what it's like. Um, so it's wonderful to to bring in pa patients to educate, um, and it's really good when you can find a provider who's dealing with a chronic problem themselves. <laughs> Suddenly, oh, yeah, the world definitely. changes. Definitely. Yeah. Very empathic. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Sorry, my audio just cut out for a second there. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum, I think that was, yeah, it's, you know, Gwen, that's on me, like, you know, hopefully we can find ways to do more of that. And I think getting, you know, reaching out to the medical profession as much as we possibly can is, is really important. Um, so I wanted to kind of <coughs> close by asking you all to answer this, this sort of final question since we're, we're coming up at an hour, even though the conversation is wonderful and I feel like we could talk about this forever. Um, you know, what do you, what is the one thing you want to tell a person who right now in this moment is feeling that helplessness and that isolation and, and possibly considering suicide? Like, what are, what is, what one or two things would you tell them to do and what advice would you have for them? Um, so Dr. Lev, maybe we can start with you. Um, very simply, um, to talk with someone uh, to and in yourself, which is a challenge when you're filled with those kinds of thoughts, to consider there are other options, and there are other options that you may not know about. And when you talk with someone, especially a professional, may be familiar with this, can provide you the support to move to the next step um, to consider other options. So that's what I would say. Thanks, uh, Dr. Rosenbaum. What would be your advice? Um, when you're feeling uh, this way, to understand uh, this is all things pass. Um, you know, it's the, the advice which is given to help you feel uh, stable, you know, not too excited, not too uh, depressed, but, you know, this is how you're feeling this moment, another time, another place, you will feel differently. Um, and to emphasize how myopic you, you are looking at the world with blinders right now. It's all you're seeing. This is what you're seeing. And there's a wider range out there that you can't see it, so it feels terrible, but it really is there, honest. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at that moment, you know, you're allowing the pain to completely control you. So the whole thing is getting control back again from the pain, uh, realizing that, okay, um, what have I done in the past? You know, what I can do now and then developing a program of when this happened before, what did, what did I do? What did you do to get through it? And, and to use, you know, to use that plan again, you know, a flare up, you know, um, prevention plan. But um, mainly to take that, this is the moment where we have to take back the control um, and not let the pain control us. 
That's great advice. And I do, so I wanna remind people that um, in the handout section of the control panel, uh, we do have some different resources listed, including some different um, hotlines for, for suicide crises. We also have um, some information about the pain connection support groups. And I'd like to point out that we have, I think it's like between 10 and 15 in-person support groups, but there's also three phone calls a month. And they're basically conference calls that you can call in for free and just listen or or talk. Um, they're led by Glenn. Um, so I think that's also a great place to start if you're you're feeling sort of isolated, alone. Um, you know, as we've talked about, just having someone say, "I believe you," and and I understand this is really difficult, can you know mean the world to someone who is struggling. Um, so thank you guys all for your. There's one, there's one other, oh, there's one other um, important resource is Crisis Text Line, where okay. you can just text 741741 24 hours a day, wherever you oh. Gwen, your audio cut out a little bit. We, can't, we couldn't hear that last part. Your audio cut out for a second. Okay. We got up to the text okay. number. Oh, crisis text line seven four one seven four one. It's okay. twenty four hours a day where you could text anywhere, you know, so you don't have to be worried about what somebody's going to be thinking about you. You just text them, and somebody that's trained will text you back and help you to get to the resources that you need. Yeah. And sometimes you don't feel well enough to call, you know. So sometimes. Yeah. 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 A good alternative. Um, so thank you all so much. So what I'm going to do is just open it up to questions from the audience for a few minutes since um, we're approaching two o'clock here. So one question I have um, from someone named Catherine is, you know, if we, if we know that sleep is such a huge problem for chronic pain, you know, why don't providers address that more? I mean, you know, uh, how does <laughs> so Dr. Um, Rosemary, do you want to, do you want to touch um, on that? Uh, yes, uh, this has been an ongoing frustration for me. Uh, in terms of why don't they, one of the problems with sleep is neurologists don't like to touch it because, um, oh, we're, we're, we're all about Parkinson's and Huntington's and things like that. So it's, it's psychiatrists. And psychiatrists don't want to touch it because there's not an easy uh, medication fix for mm -hmm. sleep although there are some roles for medication. And internists don't want to touch it because it's just, they're overwhelmed. And so there's nobody in a medical system, usually, who's an advocate for working with sleep. Um, and there's, there's lack of education in, in the medical community. Um, those are the reasons now as to the solutions, <laughs> as to how to uh, educate people about how important sleep is, because it's a medical problem as well. It, it increases the risk totally. of, of cardiovascular disease and dementia and all kinds of things. Uh, I think advocacy, education, you know, all the other things, um, yeah. and uh, assertiveness with the, with the medical system. It's really important. I mean, all of the research, there's just tons of research that this is a really important area. And there, are, and 85% of sleep problems will respond to some fairly simple interventions. Right. And I yeah. would add to the people who are listening, mm -hmm. you become advocates of sleep for the people in your life and for yourself. You get at least seven hours. And if you're having problems with sleep, see someone who can help you with it. So even yeah. you, you don't need just professionals. All of us can spread that word. Right. And I think, Dr. Rosenbaum, as you were saying earlier, when you're groggy for whatever reason, you know, you're so much more likely to not be thinking clearly about a situation and get yourself stuck in that vicious cycle, which is why addressing mm -hmm. is so important. And something Dr. Lev and I had sort of talked about previously that I wanted to mention is I think um, making sure that you're looped into a pain specialist who values that interdisciplinary care, um, mm -hmm. you know, might be the best decision you can make from the forefront and sort of researching in your area um, a pain center that, you know, lists having a sleep specialist, lists having a counselor, and even if they don't have them on staff, at least somewhere on their website talks about that so that they, you know, maybe have the sense 
um, of the whole picture of what's going on and can better help you. Um, so let's see for other questions. I, I just wanted to mention two comments. Um, one was someone thanking you, Dr. Rosenbaum, for mentioning the financial impact because that's such a huge factor. Um, and someone else named Anne was, you know, commenting on that the tremendous lack of knowledge in the medical community has to be like a huge um, player here. Um, one question we have from Roberta is, what can you do for as a loved one? Um, for someone who has severe chronic pain and is, you know, really struggling. Um, Gwen, I know that, you know, you and your husband work closely on, you know, the caregiver perspective. Um, did you want to give some advice on that? Yeah, I mean, all our programs, our support groups and our phone calls are open to, you know, significant others. We really encourage people to attend. You know, when we do training, well, so we encourage caregivers to be there. But it's um, also, um, you know, to have the resources available, you know, contact U.S. Pain Foundation, you know, other agencies to find out what's out there. Um, there's Caregivers Association because it's really important that they take care of themselves because they're doing everything now because the other person can't do it. So they're also overstressed and they have depression also. And they're not taking care of themselves because they're taking care of the person in front of pain. So they really need to take care of themselves also. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's almost the same program the person in front of pain is going through. The caregiver has to, you know, take care of themselves also. Right. Um, does anyone else, yeah. have, there was another comment here, a couple comments actually, about the role that insurance coverage plays. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which could be its own whole situation. Um, but people sort of commenting on the fact that, you know, they want to seek this help, but it's not always covered by insurance. And and sort of like, what do you do then if your insurance is not really affording you those opportunities to the treatment you need? Yeah, I know in a lot of states, and I don't know which states um, they're doing it, where for certain conditions, they allow massage therapy or acupuncture or biofeedback. So some states are already doing it, and I don't know which ones, so probably somebody who's listening on the call will probably know about that. Um, but there are, um, like on the committee I was just on, I mean, that's one of the things we try to attack also, is to get insurance companies to do you know, biofeedback, massage therapy, Reiki, you know, all these therapies that do work for people, you know, in chronic pain. And if they especially want somebody to increase their opioids, then they really need to be providing other modalities that people can get, you know, help from. Yeah. So. You can, you can also um, and I'd like to suggest, uh, I'm going to talk over Daniel, because I don't think he's going to say oh, please. it. Please. Um, <laughs> uh, if, if you can't afford to, to go to someone else, Daniel's just written a book. Uh, on a comfort strategies for dealing with pain, which I, I re honestly think is the best self-help book out there. And it's much better when you can get other people to work with you to, to help. But Daniel's book, unlike a lot of the books which are kind of, okay, do this and you're gonna feel better. And you know, Daniel's book is, I think, very real. Uh, it says, you know, when you do this, it, this might happen and watch out for that. And uh, uh, there's a lot of good strategies for things you can use yourself, mm -hmm. um, but of course, find someone else to help you as well. I, I was actually going to say, although the book, You Are Bigger Than the Pain, fabulous book, but what I was going to suggest is that you look and see what medical programs have interdisciplinary programs, such as Kaiser. And once you join one of those, I mean, Kaiser is insurance and medical treatment, but something that your health insurance will cover, then you can enter that program. I mean, there, there are, are many others too. You can enter that program knowing your insurance covers it. Right. And I think, you know, working with your primary care doctor or clinician, um, sometimes they might be able to help you sort of fight for coverage of certain things if you can, you know, argue that something's medically necessary. Um, but I think, you know, making sure to utilize those those free or cheaper resources like support groups and like self-help books and, you know, even Googling for chronic pain blogs and just, you know, finding someone to connect with 
that way um, or just, you know, like plugging you with pain, but like coming to one of our, we have like take control of your pain of education day. And you know, you come mm -hmm. for education, but I think what people find is that they get to meet other people with pain and that's, that's the real draw. Um, I think, you know, there are things that it's definitely a huge frustration that, you know, insurance doesn't always cover um, the things that we would like it to. I mean, the good news is that because, you know, not that the opioid crisis is good news, but, you know, sort of the yeah. silver lining is that we are seeing, you know, more people paying attention to the fact that we need more options for chronic pain. Um, and we're seeing at a federal level that, you know, there's more um, bills coming through that are allotting funding to researching new treatments, new, you know, new medicines. And what would be great and something that we should keep in mind as an organization is, is using this as an, also a window of opportunity to push for, you know, non clinical, non-pharmaceutical options and um, pushing for, you know, better coverage for therapies and um, like mm -hmm. whether it's mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever the case might be. So, um, so we're about five minutes after two. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up here, but I want to thank the three of you so, so much for joining um, and offering your insight um again you know we mentioned dr lev's book which i believe um dr lev what's the name of it again i think you we're are bigger than the pain right um it's on amazon okay and then we have gwen with pain connection which is painconnection.org all kinds of support mm -hmm. groups um dr rosenbaum i know you do a lot in your area with uh, meditation and mindfulness and you have a couple books out there um, and then, of course, U.S. Pain Foundation and uspainfoundation.org. Um, there are a lot of resources there. So um, we're going to do our just department updates next from um, for our volunteers. So whoever wants to stick around for that is more than welcome to. But again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum. Thank you, Dr. Lev. And thank you, Gwen. Um, we really appreciate your time and expertise. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, Emily, and all of the folks you. at uh, U.S. Pain Foundation for all of your work. It's it's tremendously valuable. Thank you. We're Thank happy, you. To, happy to try to help as best we can. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to our PowerPoint. Um, and if you, Thank if you, anyone else has... Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Send me your phone Thank number. You. Thank you, Gwen. You are awesome. Thank you. Yeah, all three of you are awesome. And thanks to everyone for listening and for asking such great questions. Yes. yes. Okay. Bye. Bye.